In the late 1970s, one family had a vision. A groundbreaking vision unlike any other, at least at the time. Canada's largest shopping center. The world's largest shopping center. Not just a shopping center though, a mall. And not just a mall, so much more than that. A mega mall, the world's first mega mall. Hundreds of stores, all under one roof. Unique, exclusive, high-end stores. And more of them. More than any other shopping center in the world. And those stores would be just one piece of an attraction's destination, the likes of which the world had never seen. In the end, over 800 stores would be laid out in a sprawling center, covering 120 acres. Featuring additional attractions, like water slides, skating rinks, and three separate dining areas including one which was themed like a Louisiana street. And there were other themes as well, like the high-end shopping district, Europa, themed like a Parisian boulevard. It overlooked the miniature golf course, which itself was modeled after the famous Pebble Beach golf course in California. And in between all these attractions and stores, there was a mall-wide zoo. Dolphins jumped high in the air, alongside the submarines which took travelers on a trip showcasing 200 varieties of sea life. There were penguins and sharks. And even away from the lake area, there were peacocks, tiger cubs, monkeys, and flamingos, just to name a few. So I grew up just outside of Vancouver, British Columbia, and there was nothing like West Edmonton Mall anywhere close to us. Uh, Disneyland was 2,000 kilometers to the south, and Canada's Wonderland was 4,000 kilometers to the east. So to us, West Edmonton Mall was our Disneyland. But before all of this came to be, there was the first major attraction in West Edmonton Mall. It wasn't always a part of the mall, mind you. The attraction didn't officially open until 1983. And by that time, West Edmonton Mall had already existed for two years. The mall first opened its doors on September 15, 1981. At that point, it was only as big as its phase one is today. Three anchor tenants, Eaton's, Sears, and the Bay, a food court, and some spectacular fountains. Difficult to believe in this day and age, but in 1981, West Hampton Mall, and its lone phase, was already the world's largest fully enclosed shopping center. And it was just getting started. Less than two years down the road, the mall's second phase had its grand opening on August 17, 1983. The mall was the first of its kind to house its own skating rink, and it, along with another notable addition, brought the first major attractions to West Edmonton Mall. Of course, the other attraction we're talking about was the world's largest fully enclosed amusement park, Fantasyland. And the addition of the park also inspired the mall's then tagline or motto, which was often used to promote the mall during those years, where fantasies come true. News about the expansion also touted Phase 2's inclusion of a McDonald's restaurant. At 8,235 square feet, it was announced to be the largest indoor McDonald's. Ignoring the idea that most McDonald's are in fact located indoors, this statistic referred to the fact that it was the largest McDonald's inside of another facility, a mall for example. Located directly across from the main entrance to Fantasyland, it was actually quite sizable taking up the same amount of space as what is typically used by a full-size retail store. Preparations for Fantasyland's opening showcased just what was to come, workers rushing to finish up the park, with work still being completed in the weeks leading up to the gala unveiling. The gala unveiling where 10,000 lucky guests were invited to visit Edmonton's newest attraction, and the rest of the mall's fabulous Phase 2 expansion. A champagne formal event which announced the nearly 50,000 square foot facility, an amusement park which was unlike any other. And one which featured an impressive offering of rides and attractions. The grand opening advertisements listed 17 amazing features, some of which included the Kitty Climb, Merlin's Haunted Laboratory, a rock crawl, 
the mystery mountain climb, the mountain bobsled, the flying galleon, the misguided motor cars, the carousel, the fantasy excursion railroad, the balloon race, the swing of the century, the 35th Aero Squadron, spelled Aero Squadron for some reason, the Kitty Convoy, jumping fountains, a shooting gallery, and arcade games. Which all sounds pretty impressive, though slightly less so when you consider that the first five things listed were simply all different parts of the Kitty Play Park, known as Fantasy World. The Kitty Climb likely referred to the oversized colorful blocks, which kids could, well, climb on. It may also refer to the ball pit area, which itself had climbable slides and slopes. I was just shy of my third birthday, and we so much loved going up to Fantasyland when we were young. It was just such a thrill. We had nothing of the sort here in Calgary. The Stampede, of course, does not compare. Merlin's Haunted Laboratory almost certainly referred to the ground-level tunnels. Accessible via oversized dominoes, these tunnels proved to be rather frightening for younger children. Inside, there was a statue of Merlin the Wizard. Those who recall it describe it as an animatronic and, well, scary figure. At least for kids, anyway. The Rock Crawl and Mystery Mountain Climb referred to the pathways clinging to the side of the rock face and throughout the levels of the large play structure in the area. And the so-called Mountain Bobsled referred to the large red slides, which would coast down from the upper platforms. There I am going down the slide. We got a camcorder that Christmas, and those things were expensive. We certainly couldn't afford something like that, but luckily got one for Christmas, and they were $1,500 Canadian for a Sony camcorder, and uh, adjust that for inflation today, and boy, oh boy. There's no evidence to indicate that these five names were referred to ever again. They seem to exist solely in the original promotional advertisements of the park's opening. What's interesting is that, when coming up for the different names for the different parts of the play park, the advertisements didn't mention the rising and dropping balloon ride which lived directly in the center of that area. One might assume that it simply didn't exist yet, but here it is at the Champagne Gala preview. Back then, Fantasyland even offered supervised childcare within this area. Mom and Dad could go to a movie while the kids played at Fantasyland. Not a bad deal for either party. To commemorate the grand opening of the park, a time capsule was buried in one of the pillars near the main entrance. Scheduled to be opened 50 years later, it contained, among other items, tapes and records from local radio stations, autographed balls from the Edmonton Eskimos and the Edmonton Trappers, and a pair of Wayne Gretzky's hockey gloves. Opening day was advertised to feature appearances by Paddington Bear and Snoopy. Years later, at Triple Five's Mega Mall property in Minnesota, the Mall of America would theme its park as Camp Snoopy. And for the first 13 years of its existence, the Peanuts gang encompassed the identity of the park. Though, it eventually changed branding. It's interesting to consider that the first amusement park connection between Peanuts and Triple Five would have in fact existed nearly a decade before Mall of America, at the opening of Fantasyland in Edmonton. Fantasyland, whose most extreme ride at the time, could be considered either the swing of the century, whose prominence in the park for over 35 years has made it an amusement park icon. I was already 15 on my first visit to Fantasyland, so unfortunately I've only experienced the adult rides. I wish I could have experienced the kids climbing area and dozens of other small rides, but they are only a visual memory for me. But what I recall being really, really awesome the swing of the century, which is still there today. Not only has it remained popular with riders, but its prominent location, along with its attractive spinning and tilting animation, has essentially made this ride an institution in itself. Or possibly, the Flying Galleon was the most extreme ride. Residing just inside the park's main entrance, directly next to the carousel, the Galleon was themed with its very own water feature, a waterfall which flowed over the exit path from the ride. I remember being on the swinging pirate ship with my sister, and about halfway through the ride, all I hear is the kid in front of us starting to yell, he's gonna puke! And we looked at the friend next to him, and he was turning green. And uh, the bars, the lap bars come up, the kid that was turning green immediately got up, ran three steps off the pirate ship, and just completely lost his lunch. <laughs> 
and my sister and I, who were still behind them, just looked at each other and we've never been more scared uh, about a close call on a ride like that before, but uh, made for a memorable experience, that's for sure. This was all that existed in Fantasyland. The park didn't have any roller coasters or thrilling rides to excite and attract older audiences. It was only as large as what is seen here. That's not to imply that the footprint of the mall didn't extend north from the park. It did, but with retail space. Hometown hardware was situated in the space directly behind the Ferris wheel, which is known as the balloon race. And because the area beyond was retail space, the Fantasy Excursion Railroad, later renamed to the Fantasyland Express, had its track run along the edge of the park adjacent to the store, under the mountain facade of the kids' play area, and then back around directly in front of it. It would make a relatively short jaunt before arriving back at the lakeside train station. The water feature which sat adjacent to the station would eventually be home to an animatronic fisherman, casting his line into waters filled with remote-controlled boats similar to those once seen next to the submarine attraction, or even today in the Deep Sea Adventure Lake. But before Fantasyland's first lake was home to RC watercraft, it was home to Fantasyland's first water-based attraction, the Kitty Bumper Boats. These smaller, battery-powered, motorized boats were aimed at a younger audience. Kids were free to roam around the lake at their leisure, though getting wet from splashes in the shallow pool was not unheard of. The opening of the park saw Fantasyland presented as a well-rounded and uniformly themed amusement park, with tall, sprawling facades imitating the architecture of yesteryear on one side, facing wide-open mountain landscapes on the other. The park's identity might be best described as a fantasy carnival from the 19th century. A large, old-timey carousel greeted visitors just inside the main gate, its music setting the stage for the rest of the park. and. Other rides were largely oriented and named to reflect a similar feel. Bumper cars were presented as misguided motor cars. The train? An old-style steam locomotive. The old-fashioned colorful biplanes were not only a fun ride for kids, but also extended up into the air as theme-appropriate decor. The wooden pirate ship, the mountain paths, it all fit in perfectly at Fantasyland. But even though it was already the world's largest indoor amusement park, like the rest of West Edmonton Mall, it wasn't done yet. Though it wasn't initially planned, there was far more to come. New, extreme rides, updated and expanded themes, and even a bit of controversy lay on the road ahead. But in 1983, Fantasyland, along with the Ice Palace, had taken the first step toward the transformation of Edmonton's newest and the world's largest mall. An important milestone on the journey from mere shopping center to that of mega mall greatness. From biplanes to bumper cars, steam engines to mystery mountain climbs. With carousels and motor cars, a good old fashioned carnival experience. And the great white north zone, amusement park icon, Canada's Fantasyland. Holy shit.